<clears throat> Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you here today. Uh, thank you for tuning in for our program. Uh, just started here. Today's program is about Pendleton County's Heroes of the Great War. The Great War was called the Great War because of the enormous scale of the war, or it, because it was a great big war. Um, it was also called the War to End All Wars. This was a phrase coined by author H.G. Wells. Uh, if you're not familiar with H.G. Wells, he wrote The War of the Worlds, and you might be uh, familiar with that. Uh, Pendleton County sent about 400 men to fight in this war. 19 of these soldiers lost their lives. Two died in battle, one from wounds received in battle, one on the transport ship, the Ticonderoga, and the rest died of disease, mainly measles, Spanish influenza, and pneumonia. This program will focus on the four that did not die from disease. They were the heroes of the Great War. Well, first of all, though, we're going to give a little bit of background information. So, the World War I began in Europe in 1914, but the United States did not get involved until April the 6th, 1917. The U.S. sent more than 2 million soldiers to fight, and around 50,000 of them died in France over the period of involvement. The armistice was more commonly known as the Treaty of Versailles, was signed by, the Ger by Germany on the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918, bringing about the formal end of the war. This meant that the United States was involved in the war for roughly one and a half years. You're probably wondering, why did the U.S. get involved? Well, basically the U.S. got involved over um, when tensions arose between the the United States and Germany. The U.S. and Great Britain had long engaged in trade with each other. So when, Great, when Germany attempted to quarantine the British Isles, tension developed. Several U.S. ships traveling to Great Britain were damaged or sunk by German mines. And in February of 1915, Germany announced unrestricted warfare against all ships, neutral or otherwise. Um, that entered in this zone around Great Britain. Some of the ships uh, that were um, sunk were the William P. Fry, the Lusitania, the Housatonic, and there was also an Italian liner that was uh, sunk. Uh, all of these, and some other ships. Um, but these, these four were kind of the main ones that kind of got us involved. U.S. deaths and damages that were uh, to U.S. property that resulted from that um, created enough tension that the United States did get involved. This is a picture of the William P. Fry. Um, this was sunk in March of 1915. It was a private American vessel. The United States got. Um, upset about it. Uh, a lot of things were said and Germany did apologize, calling the sinking a mistake. However, in May of the same year, just a couple of months later, the uh, Lusitania, was, uh, which was a British ocean liner, was sunk, killing 1,198 of the 1,959 passengers on board this number, included, number of deaths included 128 Americans. The Germans claimed that the Lusitania was carrying munitions. The U.S. again made demands, including reparations, and Germany pledged to see to the safety of passengers before sinking any unarmed uh, vessels. But in November, they sunk an Italian liner without any warning, killing 272 people, 27 of whom were Americans. Up to this point in time, Americans uh, in general did not favor getting involved in World War I. But once this uh, Americans began to die from ships being sunk, um, they start, the American public began to change their, their mind. 
1917, Germany announced that they would resume unrestricted warfare in the war zone waters, meaning that U.S. ships were no longer safe if they had uh, ever been safe. Three days after that announcement, the Housatonic was uh, sunk. This was an American liner. Um, and in late March, as you can see, the, the uh, Housatonic was originally named the uh, SS Pickhuban and in 1890 and was renamed the SS Georgia in 1895. It was reflagged as an American ship named the SS Housatonic in 1915. Um, so three days after it was, um, let me, in late March, um, Germany sunk four more U.S. merchant ships, and on April 2nd, Woodrow, Pre President Woodrow Wilson asked Congress to declare war. Congress granted his request on April the 6th. The United States then entered the war on the side of the Allied forces, which were made up of the United Kingdom, France, Russia, and now the United States. Since I know uh, there's probably more than a few genealogists in the crowd, I'm going to give you a list of the people who died of disease as well. Uh, these names that I'm going to give you right now, along with the four who are the main topic of our program today, um, were listed in the Falmouth Outlook, and that was dated Friday, June the 6th, 1919. Um, and then they were also named in the Louisville Courier Journal, dated Tuesday, the 2nd of June, 1919. The Courier Journal had one person they did not name that was named in the Outlook. So I've included both of those here. If you want to get a copy of those, copy that down for your records, if maybe you have someone that you think was involved in this war and died. Um, although the men I'm going to name were not the subject of the program, uh, most never left the United States, therefore they didn't see um, any combat, but I still did not want to just negate their service or their heroism. Um, they were all young, they died away from home and away from their family, so we just wanted to kind of pay tribute to them. I've listed them here by um, location. So from Carntown, we had Alvy Record. From Catawba, Julius Gosney, Vernon Gray Purdy, William H. Schnorr, and Henry Clark Ballinger. Henry Clark Ballinger was the only one not on the Courier Journal list. From DeMosville, Monroe um, Culbertson, and Louis Gray. Falmouth, Lou Deeney, James Henry Kelly, James Malloy, Roy Victor Martis and Roy Yelton. Roy Martis died from measles. He actually had pneumonia, and, but that was a, a result of having had measles. And Roy Yelton uh, died of the Spanish influenza. From Foster, we had Chris Eshman. And from Morgan, Holly Coffey and Marion Clemens. Marion Clemens died from the Spanish influenza as well. Holly Coffey is kind of a, an interesting situation. Um, when this list was published in the Falmouth Outlook, Warren Schoenert said, who is Holly Coffey? <laughs> he didn't have a clue. Um, so he got to digging around and he found out that Holly Coffey was actually registered for the draft, actually registered for the draft in Morgan County, which was his home county, not Morgan Pendleton County. Um, however, he had a connection to Morgan Pendleton County. He worked for the l &N Railroad and was living in the section houses at Morgan in Pendleton County at the time he entered the service, even though he was registered from Morgan County. So because he did have a connection and some people at Morgan did know him, I went ahead and kept him in this list. And he was mentioned in, in both the Courier Journal and the Found Without Luck list. Um, so anyway, of the remaining four men, we're going to start with Charles Zoller. He was from Catawba, and we do have a picture of him. There it is. He was um, the son of Mr. and Mrs. Valentine Zoller, and he was married to the former Flora Ballinger at the time of his death. He was on the USS Ticonderoga when it was torpedoed and sunk by the German submarine known as U-152. 
This, um, the Ticonderoga was roughly 1,700 miles from the coast of Great Britain when it was sunk on September the 30th, 1918. 213 men perished. Charles Zoller was 27 years old. He and his wife had been married just a little over a year. They married in June of 1917. He registered for the draft in Pendleton County. Uh, however, they were living in Cincinnati at the time because of his job. He was an iron worker. Zoller's death did not appear in the Falmouth Outlook until the 1st of November, 1918. So that is um, nearly a month and a couple of days after uh, the sinking of the ship. The, the Outlook began the announcement by saying that his wife, who was living with her parents at Catawba while he was in the service, received a telegram last Wednesday telling her of his death. The men, uh, it also went on to say that the men on board the ship were not allowed to tell where they were going when they left, but according to this article, they were all told to write a letter home prior to leaving, and once they landed safely in Europe, those letters would be sent home. Um, Charles Zoller's letter was erroneously sent. So he, his wife did receive a letter from him saying that he had arrived in Europe safely. Uh, Zoller and his shipmates left Newport News, Virginia sometime in the middle of September. Mrs. Zoller received the letter on the 21st of October, which was about three weeks after the Ticonderoga sank. So can, you can probably imagine what was going on in her mind. Here she had been thinking that he was on the Ticonderoga and that it sunk. Um, she may have not known he was on the Ticonderoga necessarily, but may have wondered about it. And then she gets a letter that he's okay. And just a few days later, uh, she gets a telegram, literally uh, about 10 or 11 days later, she gets a telegram saying that he died. Here is a picture of the USS Ticonderoga. Um, I found this on Wikipedia. It is a public domain picture if you're interested in getting a copy of it for, some, for your research. Um, it was built in 1914 as the German flag merchant steamer, the Camilla Rickmers. It was seized when the United States entered World War I and was renamed Ticonderoga in August of 1917. She was placed in commission as the USS Ticonderoga on the 5th of January, 1918. Mrs. Uh, Zoller did not receive any information about her husband's death other than he was on board the ship and lost at sea. Later on, on uh, December the 13th, 1918, the Outlook ran an article describing the sinking of the Ticonderoga. The paper also published a letter received by Mrs. Zoller, the widow, from a mother of another soldier lost on board the ship. Uh, that letter appeared in the Family Outlook on the 16th of May, 1919. I used those two sources to uh, come up with the information I'm going to give you next. Um, most of the accounts were similar. There were some small variances, um, and you'll see some of that here. The first eyewitness account described the ship as being fired on and the captain and gun crew killed. He said a fire had broken out on the ship and they quickly put that out. Um, he described lowering the lifeboats and stated that in the confusion and the excitement, most of the men on board were drowned. The remaining men surrendered once they realized the ship was sinking. Another recalled the danger whistle blowing. Um, he believed it was a drill with the lifeboats, but then he, then he heard the guns, so he rushed up to the deck and he said everything was just in total confusion. The ship's guns had been shot away and he reported the lieutenant killed and the captain severely wounded. He also repo reported that the boat was on fire. Where Charles Zoller was during this and what exactly happened to him remains unknown. His body was never recovered. Our next person is Earl W. Elliott, and he was from the town of Falmouth. He was born in Falmouth on February, I mean, on the 5th of August, I don't know where I got February there, the 5th of August, 1895, 
and he died from wounds received in action on the 19th of July, 1918. He was the son of Martin and Elizabeth Fields Elliott and was single. Here is his tombstone. Uh, it can be found in Riverside Cemetery. Um, note the date of death there is July 9th, 1918. Often the dates reported in the outlook uh, that were on the telegrams that the loved ones received don't match up with the dates on the uh, tombstones. I don't know. I, some of these I, I checked the battles and came up with the dates. Um, which date I thought was better, but I don't really know that that's accurate or not. Um, Earl W. Elliott, August 5th, 1895. Date of death was July 9, um, 1918. And it says he died for his country, killed in battle in France. Earl Elliott enlisted in June of 1917 and was sent to France in October with Company K, 9th U.S. Infantry. Although I failed to find published letters, this article in the paper did refer to him as having written home and that he told his parents he was in the firing line and had been in hand-to-hand -hand encounters with the Hun. Uh, you're going to hear the phrase Hun a lot. Um, and if you read, go to the Outlook and read some of these letters from this time frame, you'll see it. It's just a term that they use to describe the Germans. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to quote from the Falmouth Outlook, dated the 23rd of August, 1918. Uh, it says when it starts with quote. When the Germans launched their great offensive last March, Earl was with the American divisions, which were then few in number, and helped to stem the tide of, of the onrushing German horde. He fought in the various sectors until the opening of the great Allied offensive against the Crown Prince's army between Soizen and Reims. And it was in the first day's fighting there that he received his fatal wounds." End quote. Earl Elliott was the first from Pendleton County to die in the battle-related death. Earl's brother Clark was also serving with the U.S. Marines at that time. Our third person is Augustus Daniel Harden. He was from Mount Auburn. The paper listed him as a Falmouth mailing address. Um, and the name Harden is spelled H-A-R-D-E-N and H-A-R-D-I-N. You will see both of them in, used interchangeably and in, in Gus Harden's family. Here is his marker also at Riverside. It says Gus D. Harden, 1895 to 1918, killed in battle in France. And here is a picture of Gus on the left. On the far right, Gus and his brother Bill uh, can be seen standing on the hay bale. Gus is the one on the left side of the hay bale, our left if you're looking at him on the left. And the far right um, is Bill or William. It was reported in the Falmouth Outlook on the 29th of November, 1918, that Mr. and Mrs. John G. Harden of Mount Auburn received a telegram on Saturday, November 23rd, 1918, informing them of his death. Gus listed, enlisted on May the 5th, 1917, at the age of 21. Initially, he joined the 2nd Kentucky National Guard, Company A, and was stationed in Falmouth through the uh, early part of the summer of 1917. His brother, William, or Bill, uh, enlisted at the same time, and the two stayed together until they reached France in June of 1918. When his parents, uh, when Gus's parents received the telegram of his death, they had not yet heard from William since he landed in France. Um, after leaving Falmouth, Gus Harden was stationed at Camp Stanley near Lexington, Kentucky, and then at Camp Shelby in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. It was here in Mississippi that his regiment became part of the 149th Infantry. In June of 1918, Gus was sent to France with what was known as the Camp Shelby June Automatic Replacement Draft. According to the Falmouth Outlook, 
these men were highly trained in trench tactics, hand grenades, machine gun, and other trench warfare, and so were sent immediately to the firing line to fill the places of casualties in various units. So they did not fight together as a unit. They were sent, simply sent to fill in holes created by war casualties and other units already on the front. The telegram that his parents received stated that he was killed in action on the 20th of October, 1918 in France. A sworn statement uh, given by Captain Clyde Steffi, S-T-E-P-H-E-Y, of Company L, 4th Infantry, uh, stated that Hardin was shot through the neck while making an attack in the Argonne Forest on October the 15th, 1918, and that he died the same day and was buried in the same place. Um, Gus's body was returned to the United States and arrived in Falmouth on the 13th of September, 1921, three years after his death, uh, to be buried in Falmouth at Riverside. One Schonert Sr., the editor of the Falmouth Outlook, reported uh, in the earlier mentioned November 29th article, and I quote, uh, Gus Harden was a good boy, quiet and unassuming, just the right type to make a splendid soldier. When he enlisted, it was his great desire to meet the Hun in open combat. He wanted to go to France and help make the world free and a decent place to live in. Today, all that was mortal of him lies beneath the martyred soil of France, red with the blood of him and countless of thousands of his like. This was the greatest price of world freedom. Nothing in this world can reconcile the stricken parents, but we feel sure that their great sorrow is mingled with that spirit of patriotic pride that he died for humanity. And next we move on to our last uh, person, Walter W. Browning, and his address was the city of Falmouth. Uh, Walter's letters were regularly featured in the Falmouth Outlook. Not only did he write family and friends, but he wrote letters directly to Warren Schonert Sr., who was the editor of the Falmouth Outlook. Uh, here is his stone. He's also buried at Riverside. It says uh, Riverside Cemetery, Walter W. Browning, born May 18, 1886, killed September 13, 1918, the Sam Ohio Drive. And you will see uh, that those dope dates again don't line up with um, the dates in the telegram. Uh, the Outlook had previously reported it as being on the 17th. Walter Browning was the son of Mr. and Mrs. John Browning, formerly of Falmouth, but living in Newport at the time of the war. Walter, however, lived in Falmouth, and he made his home with his sister, Mrs. Thomas Shanks. He was 32 years old at the time of his death. Walter was in the second group of men called from Pendleton County in October of 1917. He was sent to Camp Taylor and was assigned to the 326th Field Artillery. Early in the spring of 1918, he was transferred to Camp Severe in South Carolina, and then he was sent to France in June with the 114th Field Artillery. Upon his arrival in France, he was sent to the front. Um, as I said earlier, he, had, he sent several letters to the Outlook. I'm gonna read you a little bit from a couple of them. Um, the first one, these are the headlines for the first one. Browning says Fritz is a coward. Hun will not come out in open combat and his fear for cold steel is great. Gives up when opportunity comes. Allies take many prisoners. More Americans in France than Kaiser Bill ever dreamed of and they are still coming. And it starts with a, a little introductory paragraph from editor Schonard. We are in receipt of another interesting letter from Walter W. Browning, who is right up where the big show is on. Walter is pretty busy these days, but he still finds time to drop his old family friends a line once in a while. We are always glad to hear from him. 
and then the letter starts somewhere in France, August 16, 1918. And again, this appeared in the September 13th paper. So there's a big lag time in getting mail. Uh, dear editor, I thought I would drop you a few lines to let you know I'm not dead, but a very live corpse. The boys from dear old Pendleton are working hard and are anxious to go into action. We will get a chance at the Bosch for the 114th has been training in earnest and that counts over here. The guys that show the pep get all the special privileges. When the outlook comes, there is one grand rush for all the boys want to see it first. But of course, as it comes to me, and the fact that I am somewhat of a pugilist gives me first chance at the news from the old hometown. We are up here where the big, big guns roar and everything is war. Every day, the marching columns of lads and khaki go by to the front line. They are the happiest bunch you ever saw for all are eager to get into action after months and months of monotonous drilling. You can hear them singing and shouting all the time as they go up there to take part in the big battle. When the boys of some of the regiments leave, you can hear such expressions as this, we'll all be home by Christmas and lots of other things. And the boys have been in their, after the boys have been in their first battle and come out safely, the next time it is difficult to hold them back for they get bloodthirsty and want nothing better than 12 inches of cold steel and plenty of Bosches to practice on. There are more Americans in France now than the Kaiser thought would be here in four or five years, and they're coming every day. By the latter part of October, there will be enough men in training and in France to walk over all the Germans that they can tie to the front yard line but you cannot walk over them for their cowards and taken individually will not fight anything. They will not come out in the open combat, but hide in shell holes and fight until you are coming with, coming with bayonet poised and they throw up their hands and yell comrade, or if they have a chance, they run for Germany. The allies have taken so many prisoners that they don't know what to do with them but I think shrapnel will punish them best. And then he goes on to say he'd like to have a letter from home and gives his address. Walter Browning wrote what would be his last letter to be published in the Outlook on August the 27th, 1918. And it was published on the 27th of September of 1918. Um, he addressed this one to Kind Schonert and it was written from the front. The headlines that were attached to this letter were read as follows. On fire on the front lines, Walter W. Browning says that Fritz is a 4080 man and likes to fight in mass attack. Airmen battle incessantly. Witnesses battle between German and American planes. Yanks were victorious. And the letter reads at the front, August 27, 1918, kind friend Shornick. I thought I would drop you a few lines to let my friends back home know I am where the boys are doing battle with the Hun. I am at the front. I have just got in from a 400 mile hike and enjoyed it very much. As far as I know of them, all the boys are well. The front is a wonderful place, a terrible place sometimes. We can see the airplanes of the enemy as well as our own, the observation balloons of the Germans in the distance. The observation balloon of Fritz gives us a chill for we know when we see him that he is spying on our positions. We got up the other morning for breakfast and were entertained by a duel in the air between two American planes and one Bosch. The latter machine having come over our lines for the purpose of photographing our positions. Poor old Fritzy went home empty handed. Several planes have been shot down in our sector of the front. The other day, the beast got peeved and fired 800 rounds into part of our regiment. It scared us um, a little for a while, but these things we must face here. There is no turning back. The Yanks give, me gr give no ground to any Hun. A while ago, as I was sitting near my tent, the German guns opened up on one of our observation balloons that was not far from my tent. 
They fired about 25 rounds, but did not bring it down. Sometimes this sector is quiet for several days and then all at once it commences and hell isn't in it for several hours. I can sit here and hear them fire in several directions from either side and I can hear the machine guns spit out death from the airplanes overhead. There are duels in the air between our airmen and the Germans incessantly. The aviators are very brave and fearless men, always eager for a fight. Fritz is not so bold, however, and likes to fight when he has plenty of his comrades around to help him. Fritz is a 40-80 man. We have some very large guns in our sector and we're tuning them up and getting ready for the day. We are in const on constant alert for gas and almost sleep in our gas masks, so to speak. We are highly trained in the art of adjusting the mask and can get them on in a second or two after the alarm is sounded but we don't have to be told twice about this order. The boys don't seem to realize that they are on the front. They're always laughing and joking and having a good time. The Yankee boys certainly have the spirit that wins. This part of the country is very good and some other parts are very common. We are ready to get out at any moment when the call is sounded and at any time at night and can be ready for um, and can be ready for business within a very few minutes. We are in a position now where money has not the slightest value. France has the best wheat crop this time that it has had for several years, but there's not much fruit. There are more potatoes and garden trucks here now than ever known before. There's one thing you can do in the States that we are forbidden, and that is drink the water out of springs. The gas poisons the water in the springs and we're not allowed to touch it. Consequently, we are very conserving of our water supply. There is one thing I would like to hear them say, and it's this, it's all over now. With best wishes to all, I remain your friend, Private Walter W. Browning, Battery D, 114th Field Artillery, American Expeditionary Forces. The next news of Walter Browning came uh, in the, eight, in the uh, Falmouth Outlook dated the 18th of October, 1918. And the headline on this particular uh, bit of news read, Walter Browning killed in action. First of Pendleton County's drafted men falls in battle September 17. Telegram received Monday had written frequently and expressed his views on the Great War, had been at the front several months. And I'm only gonna read just a little bit uh, about that because most of that, what was in this is just a rehash of what I've already said. But uh, Mr. Schonert uh, opens up by saying, the grim tragedy of war was again visited upon our little city when a telegram came Monday night bearing the sad news that Private Walter W. Browning had been killed in action on the battle line in France on September 17th. No further particulars were contained in the telegram. And then he goes on, uh, it says, Walter intimated in his letter that he was somewhere south of Verdun. It's likely that he was in the famous Sam Mihail salient where the Americans covered themselves with glory in their gallant and victory, victorious offensive, which wiped out the salient and netted the Allied cause a big bag of prisoners and other booty, besides the liberation of much territory. It matters not where he fought or where he fell, for among all those fine and chivalrous boys that good old Pendleton has sent on this night errant of liberty, there was no finer or braver man than Walter Browning. He was of quiet disposition, though amiable and friendly, and was well liked by everyone. He could be depended upon under any circumstance. We think of the sacrifice of this, when we think of the sacrifice of this fine young man, of the grief-stricken parents, and especially his sister in this city, let us not forget that his grave is only one in a million or more whose lives have been sacrificed in this colossal struggle 
of right against wrong, of truth against error. In the name of honor and freedom, let us exert our ever effort to help crush militarism forever from the face of this earth. And then he goes on to encourage people to buy war bonds to help um, fund the war. By now, you're probably going, hmm, she's mentioned Hardin and she's mentioned Browning. And if you're from Falmouth, that probably rings a bell from you, for you, or Pendleton County, it probably rings a bell. The heart, you're probably wondering if they are the Hardin and the Browning in the Hardin Browning American Legion Post 109's name. Yes, they are. Uh, the Legion Post was organized on the 13th of March in 1920. This is what it looks like today. They do have a, a building today. I think initially they met in the uh, courthouse. Um, it is named after Gus Harden and Walter W. Browning and is located on 2nd and Montjoy Streets on the corner there. Uh, this was previously uh, the AME Church, Amer um, African Methodist Episcopal Church, and also the Allen Chapel. Then it later became uh, the home to the uh, American Legion Post. There were 26 charter members, and I have their names right here. They are listed in alphabetical order by last name. If it just says Falmouth, my assumption is that they lived in town because all the other Falmouths have a rural route. Um, B. Frank Gregory, who's the last name on the far left, was appointed at the, at the organizational meeting. He was appointed uh, the temporary let's see, commander. And J.T. Norris over in the second column, which is James T. Norris, was appointed as the uh, adjutant of that post at the time of founding. So I'll leave this page up for you. Uh, and you can see if you have family members uh, that serve uh, as a founding member. As with all wars since uh, World War I, Pendleton County sent its best and its bravest to fight the fight of freedom in the World War I. And these are just some of those men who made that uh, effort come to reality. This closes our program. Uh, if you have any questions and you would like to um, email me, my email address is fcar at pcplibrary.org and car is two R's, C-A-R-R. -R. Um, you can also post your questions there and I will try to, to keep up with monitoring them. Uh, I am working on additional virtual programs. In June, we will be doing a, a virtual cemetery tour of the Roanoke Cemetery. It will be on June 6th and you should be able to uh, see it on uh, our YouTube channel that morning at 10 a.m. If you have any suggestions for a future program, you can use our, uh, we, we have a form on our webpage, which is pcplibrary.org, uh, that you can fill out. It doesn't have to necessarily be a, a local history or genealogy program, but it certainly can be. Um, those get sent out to the uh, appropriate programmer and uh, are definitely looked at and considered. So keep that in mind. Thank you very much for your time and for joining us today. Um, take care, and we'll see you in June. Bye-bye.